Welcome back to the Pumped On Property Show, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's show. Today, I've got my colleague, Ben Coulter here, who is going to be helping us talk a little bit about how to buy an investment property and the top tips for property investors. So thank you so much for coming on today's show. Why don't you just start by telling everybody a little bit about yourself, Ben? Thanks for having me. Um, I work kind of in the background, I suppose, at Pumped On Property on the buying side, helping our clients um, negotiate and secure properties. Uh, I have personally been investing for about 10 years or so now. Um, just purchased my eighth property, which is um, wow. exciting. Just going through the process of that now. Um, unfortunately, I don't hold all of those or fortunately, depending on which way you look at it. Um, yeah. A couple of mistakes along the way, I think. And as of sort of my um, investing philosophy and strategy has evolved, some of those, uh, got rid of some of those assets and moved them on. But um, here we are. Yeah, always got to do that, right? Like the only constant is change, right? So you got to be willing to adapt to that. Um, but it's great that you've obviously just been through this full process for yourself and probably a lot more emotional than some of your previous decisions as well with it being your own home up here on the Sunshine Coast. So uh, amazing process there. But I guess to get this podcast started about how to buy an investment property, it always starts with you know assessing where you're at right now. Mm -hmm. um, so you know looking at your current financial situation and what you can or can't do. Um, so, you know, here you're looking at what's your income, what are your expenses, what are your liabilities, what other assets you're holding at the moment. Um, I always like to go talk with a mortgage broker or a bank manager at this stage to figure out, you know, what that financial situation actually looks like because this is really going to dictate the decision. So, how did you go through that process recently for yourself and, you know, what are some of the tips that you would give other investors so that they can make that process feel a little less stressful because let's face it, property investing, you know, you may buy, not everybody's, you know, as, as ambitious as you and, you know, most people you find will probably only ever buy four, maximum five properties throughout their whole entire life. So you need to bloody nail it when you do have that opportunity. So yeah, what are some of the tips that you would have at that stage when assessing where you're at right now and getting that confidence about what you can borrow, what you can do, what you can buy? Yeah, good question. And I think it, a lot of it comes down to what you would, you're talking to is just having a very, very clear um, picture or a clear plan in your, your head of where you're trying to go and what you're trying to get to. Um, you know, the number of properties isn't as important as, as what those properties are going to do for you. So the, the more clarity you can have around that, the better. And then you know, from there, just leaning on those different professionals is kind of always been my philosophy. Um, yeah. You know, and whether that be a bank manager or a mortgage broker is a first step to get to get a bit of a clear picture on where you're at financially and what potentially your capacity is. And then, you know, some of the other professionals that, that you might choose to work through to, to help you in the process. But I'm, a, again, a big believer in sort of working with people that, that are um, have got to where you want to be or, or at least a couple of steps in front of you sure. um, and, you know, learning from their mistakes and hopefully not having to make them yourself. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's good to know exactly where you're at as well because I know for me personally, you know, I would always want more than what I can afford. Mm -hmm. So there's always going to be a sacrifice there. So understanding what you can actually service, what you can actually borrow will then rule out a lot, you know, like, you know, I'm sure you probably would have preferred to buy a $10 million mansion on, on Sunshine Beach uh, right there. But, you know, not, not everybody is uh, stupidly rich like that and can afford those types of properties. So you've got to just work within the confines of your budget. Now, then the next step is to look at where you want to be. Now, where do I want to be in the future? What is the purpose of buying this property? Essentially figuring out your why. You know, when you're thinking about the future, is there something that you do to break that down? You know, for me personally, I look at the next 12 months, I like to look at the next five years, and then I like to look long term, which for me is sort of 10, 15 plus years into the future. Um, you know, by, uh, by doing that thought exercise, you start to think about, you know, what it is that you're trying to get out of that particular purchase. And, you know, that will obviously dictate the strategy to an extent as well as to where you should be focusing. Um, so did you want to talk to a little bit about that, you know, how to figure out where you want to be longer term? Yeah, look, my kind of approach has changed on that over time. I, I had initially set it sort of up as a, an income goal, which I, 
which I kind of figured out later was almost arbitrary. It just sounded like a nice number to work toward. Okay. Um, so as I've sort of as I sort of evolved, I've started to look more deeply. It's like, what do I want my life to look like in it? You know, in ten years' time, what's my you know what's your ideal day look like or your ideal week or what's that yeah. lifestyle look like? And then work backwards from there. So what number do you really need to fund that lifestyle? Um, and then just keep just breaking it down into its simplest steps. I'm not that good at projecting out into like a 10-year future. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, even five years is a bit more challenging for me. So I just keep pulling it down, breaking it down into more actionable steps till it feels sort of something um, more bite-sized that I can take action on because that is the most important piece of the puzzle. I think it's nice to have vision boards and lofty goals and that type of thing, but people get a little bit lost in that and just get the dopamine hit or whatever it is <laughs> having a look at their vision board, but then you know, they just shut their computer and go back to doing what they were doing anyway. I couldn't um, agree more, man. So it's just trying to find, break it down into what is an actionable step that I can take today because that step, no matter how small it is, is the only thing that's going to get you there eventually. And it's... It's, I love that so much and it's like the destination isn't the goal. Like how many people do we talk to where they're like, you know, I set this goal but by the time I achieved it, it, it didn't, I didn't feel any different. Mm. So people put so much weight on the destination and then when they, when they get there, they, don't real, they realize that it's actually not what it's cracked up to be. So I love that, you know, you live that present life and it's like, you know, if you focus on incorporating the right habits – throughout that journey, it's just going to, you know, enable that, that life to unfold perfectly. You know, for me, living presently, being super grateful and trying to frame my lifestyle in a way that, you know, fills my heart and keeps me excited uh, is, is just making that, that long-term view less, I guess, it puts less pressure on me. Like I don't feel as though I'm, I'm working towards this specific long-term thing because it's changed, you know, when I first set the strategy, it was like, I want to work towards 50 to a hundred thousand dollars worth of passive income. But then getting a partner, talking about kids, talking to friends, growing up, you know, still young and inexperienced for myself. But, you know, you start thinking about it and you're like, oh, okay, I need to stretch that a little bit further. But then I realize that I'm getting to that point where you're at right now. It's like, well, it's actually not about a specific number of properties or a specific passive income. It's more about personal development, personal growth, becoming the best version of myself and what I need to do to become the best version of myself is look after my, my friends, look after my family and the financial aspect of those things are going to come if you've incorporated those positive habits in, in your life as well, hey? Yeah, I think so. I hope so. <laughs> that's the approach <laughs> I'm taking. So <laughs> I'm not there yet. But um, yeah, I think that's, that's a good direction to go because it's, you know, Property investing or investing of any sort is obviously a long term. You know, it's going to be 10, 15, 20 years, um, and there is some sacrifice involved. But Absolutely. if the sacrifice means that you can't enjoy your life for 15 or 20 years, then I, yeah, I don't know if it's a trade off that, yeah. that I'm willing to make. <laughs> no, for hell no, because you need to be, you know, living in the moment. Like we only yeah. get one life, the future's not guaranteed. We've only got what we have right now. So do what makes you feel good. Yeah. But it's still good to have that thought exercise and think about what it is that you want your life to look like in the future because your journey began with thinking in the future and only from executing your strategy and following that path, you've now realized that that's not what it's about. But to begin, you always need to put yourself in your future shoes and think about what it is that you want because most people don't think like that. But then it's also important to take into context when you're thinking about buying an investment property what's been holding you back? You know, being aware of the challenges that you're going to have to overcome, being aware of those aspects that might hold you back is, is really important. You know, do you have the right support network around you? Do you have the right education to make the most educated decision? Um, do you have the confidence to, to be able to execute that as well? So, you know, having a look at what has held you back in the past will help you avoid making mistakes moving forward as well. Um, I don't want to talk too much about those things because, you know, it's just a part of the process. You need to be aware of the things that have held you back because otherwise, you know, these things are just having, happening habitually. You know, it's not necessarily a conscious thing. It's more of a unconscious thing with all of those challenges. And, you know, our opinion is the first step to overcoming a challenge is becoming aware of them. 
But we always always like to start with, you know, looking at where you're at right now, where you want to be in the future, what are your challenges, you know, assess those little bits and pieces before buying an investment property because it'll avoid you making those mistakes. But then obviously once you've worked through that, it's starting to move into the real nuts and bolts of how to buy an investment property, which is looking at your specific property investment goals. Um, so what's the first step to identifying those property investment goals? Yeah, so good question. But once you've established those um, kind of more overarching things like you were talking about in terms of what, you, you know, what you're trying to achieve, what your budget is, um, once we've established that budget, I think it gives you a good indication of a potential starting point. And then yeah. we want to take a bit of a top-down approach and, and kind of start broad and then begin to narrow it down. And that, you know, starting broad will mean choosing between whether you're going to purchase a property in a metro or a regional market, yep. um, you know, which, where those different markets are, it, perhaps in regards to timing as well, um, definitely plays a factor into it as well. And again, this is all working within those budget constraints that you have. Once we've picked that market, then we're going to sort of narrow it down a little bit further and, and look at what different suburbs might be, um, mm. might present opportunities. Once we've found the suburb, we're going to then narrow it down into the pocket of the suburb, down into the street, and then down to the property itself. So it's just a process of elimination in that sense, um, just narrowing it down further and further, refining, you know, taking out areas, taking out suburbs, taking out streets, taking out properties until we can really narrow in on what's going to be the best potential opportunity for you within that budget. Yeah, you really want to rule out, you know, as much as you can because when you jump onto realestate.com, there's going to be so many listings, you know, so many properties coming up, you know, units, townhouses, duplexes, houses, blocks of land, commercial sites, you know, there's so many different stuff. It's going to include the surrounding suburbs and things like that. So that can become super overwhelming to try and analyze every single one of them. So if you go through that process, you just should get to that point where you're like, no, 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 maybe, no, no, maybe, maybe. And then to figure out whether those maybes are going to turn into a yes, you know, it comes to the education side of things. So once we've developed those property investment goals, we know which market, we know which suburb, we know which property type, we know what price we're looking for. Then it's about educating yourself. Um, so how do we educate ourselves to avoid making mistakes and to purchase the best investment property? The cool thing these days is jumping on, um, jumping on YouTube or the podcast, you know, and, and having a listen to different experts and professionals in the, in the space. I suppose you can learn a whole lot. It's just about knowing who's best to listen to, I suppose, or to whose word um, to trust. So that's a, that's a really good first step, I think, is just starting to really absorb a lot of content because there is a lot that goes into um, making the best decision and, and that starts from, mm. a, from a, a very high level, you know, of, of where we're going to invest from even a state level and, and narrowing down from there. So as you said before, there's so much that we have to sort of cut and I've heard you speak to before for the, you know, a whole lot of property investing is working out what not to buy Yeah, um, and that, that pulls a lot of the plate and can help you definitely get started in the right direction. And then once we're, you know, specifically in a particular suburb, you know, what are some of the things that you would educate a client on at that suburb level so that they can get a much deeper understanding because 90% of the people that we work with aren't local to the Brisbane yeah. market. They're sort of interstate and, you know, trusting us, but we try and educate them to make more educated decisions. So what type of uh, analysis are we doing at the, at the education level? Yeah, so, you know, there's a, there's a lot to consider and both from a data perspective, but also from a more um, subjective or emotional perspective as well. So, it, you know, it's, sometimes it's hard to, repli uh, to yeah, replace just boots on the ground experience, getting a, a nice feel for a suburb, getting a feel for a particular pocket of a suburb, a feel for a particular street, what mm. cafes and, and restaurants and lifestyle things are in the area, what the proximity is to different employment um, centres, cities, satellite cities, all of that type of thing that, um, you know, I think makes sense when you think about it from a perspective of 
you know, what sort, sort, sort of things do you look for in places that you want to live? That's not to say that you want to live in that property or in that suburb, but mm. the same things still apply. You still want mm. to try and find appealing streets, um, you know, nice family-friendly, quiet streets that don't back onto mm. busy ro- that aren't on busy roads or don't back onto schools or train stations or, you know, industrial areas or they're not under power lines or next door to substations and things like that. Um, And then there's all of the the different data points and some of the things that we look for within the business. Um, You know, we're looking at what the percentage of owner occupiers to renters are. We're looking at what the vacancy rates are. We're looking at what the median house price is. We're looking at what the median weekly income is. You know, is it strong enough that people have got discretionary incomes to invest in renovating their house or Mm. paying emotional prices for Mm. nice properties? Um, you know, we're looking at distance to, to CBDs and employment hubs, distance to train stations or, or at least bus routes and things mm. like that. They're, they're some of the data points that we're drilling into as well. So there's a lot to consider. Yeah, and like to talk to that like median house price and, you know, understanding market value, uh, like it seems as though the market's constantly changing and it's, it's hard to keep your finger on the pulse as to exactly what we should be paying for a particular property. So is there a way that we can understand the pricing side of things and to get that information when, when we're buying a property? Yeah, look, as you say, the median house price doesn't always tell the full story. At the end of the day, it just is the middle house, middle sale price of a house in, in a group of houses or in a group of suburbs. So yeah. it doesn't always tell you the whole picture. Sure, it's, it's a data point. Um, and, you know, we look at all these data points individually, but it's more so how they, you know, the, the story that they tell when, when we pull them all together. Um, but in answer to your question in regards to how do we sort of identify value, you know, for us, we're in the market day in, day out doing this type of thing. So, um, you know, you start to just get a sense of, of what's selling in the area, what the values are. And that's from, you know, talking to, to leading agents in the area yep. um, and, and buying the volume of properties that we buy. So we're privileged in that sense. But for the average person, I think it does just take time. You know, the sold section of realestate.com is a good starting point, but it's it's probably not good enough just to jump on there for five minutes and have a look no. at 10 properties. It's always going to be dated. No. Yeah. You need to sort of pay attention to what the dates are, what the market's done over the last few months. Um, is there any reason why there could have been a pullback, you know, three interest rate rises in three months? Um, t- paying attention to little things like that. But I think the more time you spend on there grouping different areas of a particular suburb, finding out which are the higher value pockets of the suburb, which are the lower value pockets mm. of the suburb, why? Why is that the case? You know, are they busier roads? Are they flood affected? Is there a, a you know, a dense kind of population of housing commission in the area? Are they under high voltage power lines? All these different reasons that could affect the value. Mm. Um, it, it just takes time and proper research and, and you know, jumping on realestate.com in the sold section for five minutes isn't the answer. No. Nah. But spending that kind of time really getting educated on the area specifically will help you get a better understanding. For sure. And and when I'm I'm looking like, you know, I'll definitely look at the sold section. You know, it'll definitely help you get a bit of an indication. You know, you look at the suburb maps and I like to highlight the main roads, um, the industrial areas, the, the busier areas, the good schools, if there's a hospital or a university nearby. I like to know where these things are because then when a particular property comes up, you're like, oh, yeah, okay, cool. It's in a nice quiet street, but it's in close proximity to all of these different things as well. So that can really help. Um, I always like to talk and and identify the highest performing agents as well um, because you've got to remember that the sales agents are there to get the best result for the sellers, not the buyers. Um, But to understand who's who in the zoo, you jump on to Rate My Agent and you type in the suburb that you're looking at and it'll give you a list of how many properties have sold, the ratings from, from other vendors and things like that um, to see who you should be contacting because when you're starting to look, you want to be in touch with these, these clients on a, on a very regular basis. Um, I also like to look at average days on market to see how quick I need to be as well. You know, if those average days on market are starting to stretch out a little bit longer, I know that the power is in my hands and I know I've got a little bit more time to, to consider um, any particular purchase. But the opposite is true. If those days on markets are coming down, then, you know, you've got to be really quick to action. So you need to have all that education there done as well. 
Um, and then I'm also going to be looking at the average vendor discounting um, because this will help with my negotiations. How much do I actually have to pay? Do I have to pay market value? Can I secure it below market value? Do I have to pay over market value? Understanding the DSR score, the average days on market, the average vendor discounting will help you understand that market value. But you just need experience as well. You need boots on the ground operating in these markets because as Ben was saying, it's dated. So when that sold listing, it's been under contract for 35 to 60 days before it's even ended up on the sold section. Um, even when you're looking at the data on, on um, core logic indices, you know, it's taking time for them to be able to calculate that information and it's not relevant for that particular week. And in a softer market, that could mean that you could negotiate an extra five or $10,000 below market value. Or if it's in a hot market, it'll help you understand how much more you have to pay as well and how confident you would feel by putting in a higher offer as well. So the education is, is highly important because then you're not making a decision, you know, just off a whim, you know, you're basing it off the right type of information and analysis there as well. But then we get to the looking phase. You know, when we're buying an investment property, you're obviously going to be looking. How active are you during that looking phase? What are the habits that you incorporate for yourself and your clients when, when you're in that actually looking phase? So this is when we've, we know where we're at. We know what our budget is. We know where we want to be. We know it's holding us back. We understand our property investment goals. We're fully educated on the suburb. Now we're just looking for the right particular property because odds are the best property isn't going to come up in week one. It could you know, take two to four, five weeks to find the right property. So what are you doing in that phase? Gary Vee a, says a good thing and he, he calls it um, macro patience, micro speed. So yep. I like to look at it, we're in the market every single day. We've got the luxury of being in the market and that's from sort of scouring, you know, realestate.com and domain.com and looking for opportunities to come up, but also relationships with agents, um, you know, that they may bring us pre-market or off-market opportunities. We may go chasing them depending on what's happening and that's something everybody can do too. It mm. comes back to finding out who the best performing agents are in the area and getting in touch with them and not being a pest, but if you're giving them a call and having some clarity around what it is mm. that you're looking for, then you're helping them out in a way as mm. well. If you're a qualified buyer for a property that they're trying to sell, of course they're going to get in contact with you and they might do so before they list the property, giving you that opportunity as well. But um, coming back to what I was talking about, we're in the market every day, you know, actively pursuing, waiting for properties to come up and be listed so that when the right opportunity comes up, we can move on it quickly. But at the same time, we have the patience to wait for the right opportunity mm. to come up. So we are actively looking and trying to find the opportunities. But, you know, if that doesn't happen in the first week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, we're still proactively looking every day, but we'll be as patient as we need to be to be able to secure the right property that's got the best potential of, of um, outperforming the market over the longer term. And what I see a lot of people do is they rush in, they get fatigued and they make mm. an emotional decision or they get too excited and they make the wrong decision too soon. So how can you avoid, you know, making those mistakes and, and having the confidence that, you know, patience is a virtue? Yeah, it just comes back to being very clear on your goals, what we were talking about earlier, what it is that you're after, what you're looking for and and trying to tick those boxes. And obviously, when you're working with budget constraints, you may have to bend on, on some of those, um, you know, nice to haves. But if you've got a lot of clarity around you know, the, the type of property that you're looking for and, and what boxes it has to tick for you, you also know which ones that you might be a little bit more flexible on to fit within those budget constraints. Um, when a property ticks those boxes though, it's knowing, you know, it's moving quickly. In the market at the moment, we're sort of seeing um, a, bit, a bit more of a two-speed market. You know, there has been a little bit of a a pullback in sentiment. If you turn the, you know, listen to any media at the moment, you'll you'll feel that. Um, so we are sort of feeling that in one sense. But good quality properties are still selling very very quickly. Mm. Like if, you know, it's not um, unusual for for us to see a property listed on a Wednesday, have an open home on a Saturday, sold before the end of the weekend. Yeah. So you know, good quality properties are still moving for really good prices. So we we know that when a property does pop up, that ticks the boxes we also have to be really proactive and move quickly on that. Yeah, for sure. And then like last year was was a different reality as well. You know, like 
properties are selling within yeah. one to two days of being listed, selling above the asking price. So you just have to, you know, adapt to that. What are some of the common mistakes people make in this looking phase? And, you know, what are some of the concessions that people accidentally oversee? Because obviously you've got a lot more experience than the average person, but you're talking with average investors every single day. You know, do you often hear questions or comments from people that come up that, you need to just, you know, make sure they're realigning back to the big rocks or anything like that just because it's easy to make a mistake in, in property investing and, and make a concession, especially with the emotional fatigue that a lot of buyers face over an investment journey. It's, I think just doing, doing the right due diligence. Like everything yep. looks amazing on realestate.com <laughs> with the photo editing skills and the, the digitally enhanced dropped-in furniture it all looks great you know they show the properties in their best light um, but sometimes those you know those listings don't show the full picture and, and if you are investing into state which a lot of people are or you know you don't have the opportunity to get through the property a lot of things can be missed and you know that you know the listing photos are good at hiding like significant things has the property got a really small frontage or is it um you know, does it back onto some power lines that mm. just a couple of houses over that you can't see? You know, things like that, but then also uh, stuff that you have to dig a little bit deeper for as well, which, you know, we're doing in the background is, as a business is looking for how much housing commissions in the area are we next door to um, housing commission properties? Are we near, you know, are we in a flood area, for example? Mm. Um, are we near a, a train line? Or, or there's all these different unforeseeable things potentially on realestate.com. So making sure that you're just doing those that due diligence and not getting too drawn in by the, you know, the pretty photos on the listing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And the cool thing is these days with technologies, there's so much information out there. You know, I remember when I was buying this house that we're in right now on the Sunshine Coast, um, you know, you go into the Sunshine Coast PD hub, you go into Logan City Council PD hub, and it's just like, everything is there you know mm -hmm. you get so much more information for than free. you need for free these mm -hmm. days so it, it is actually becoming easier to assess a property and make sure it does tick the boxes but you obviously need to know what to look out for um, so that's great then we found the right property perfect this aligns with my goals this is going to get me to where I want to be it's within my budget I love the property it seems as though it's going to sell at the right price what does that part of the process look like? How do we actually buy an investment property off a real estate agent? How do you deal with those negotiations and, and do those negotiations change uh, depending on market conditions and things like that? I don't want to go too deep because we have done other videos on this that people can go into, but you know, for people that are listening to this video about how can we buy an investment property, they need to know about the negotiations as well. I think the first thing to understand is that, as you mentioned before, the, the selling agent is working for the seller. Yep. Um, they're, they're professionals. They're doing it every single day. They've, you know, for the most part, seen it all before. Um, whilst a lot of them are quite personable and quite friendly and, you know, they, they make it feel like they're doing you a favor, which is, which is their job. Um, you just have to keep that in mind that they are trying to do their very best for the seller. They're getting paid to do that, you know, and, and, more power to them for that. Yeah. You just have to play that game. You know, we have to know what questions to ask, asking the right questions, getting as much information as you can, doing things like when you submit an offer, making sure you're not ending up bidding for yourself, um, uh, bidding against yourself, I'm sorry. And that, you know, that again comes down to just asking better questions, knowing the different questions to ask um, and, and just having that knowledge. It's a hard game to play when you're competing against a selling agent who's literal full-time job is to just do this all day, every day and you might buy one, two, three, four properties in your life. It is challenging. It is challenging for sure. But I think, you know, you've nailed it on the head there as well that you're dealing with a professional. This guy does or girl does this every day and it's not, it's not uncommon for them to answer difficult questions, to deal with those negotiations. So whilst it might be foreign to the individual that's buying the property that may only buy a three, four or five properties throughout their whole entire life, you can have that confidence and you can kind of, you no, know, we don't do this, but if you're doing it by yourself, you can kind of fake it till you make it and, you know, put a bit of pressure on there as well. Um, but I think just searching for the win-win there as well. It's like, if that property does meet your strategy and tick all of the goals, 
then you want to get the best result for yourself. But that property is perfect and that person is willing to sell you the property. So you want them to be able to get the result that they want as well. And I think everybody just ends up a little bit happier from that. My mum just sold one of her properties up here on the Sunshine Coast and she was dealing with the negotiations. She was hoping to sell the property at about $840,000. Um, these guys came in initially at like 750,000 mum told them to F off and don't come back until you've got something more serious. Um, but then after spending some time dealing with the negotiations with mum's agent, they came up to about 810 and, and they were like, look, this is our our best and final offer. And then mum's like, why don't we meet halfway? And they met at $820,000. Now mum was really happy with the result. The sellers were really happy with the result. The selling agent was really happy with the result. Now everybody feels confident moving forward into that under contract phase as well. Um, So, you know, seek out that win-win. And I think if you are wanting to learn more about negotiating, there is a top-notch book called The Secrets of Power Negotiating by Roger Dawson. Uh, Get it on audiobook, get it on hardcover, whatever you prefer, but... um, great book if you are not very experienced with negotiating, not very savvy with it, or feeling a little bit overwhelmed about that part. Um, Or this is where Ben comes in. You know, Ben's obviously been able to help a lot of our clients. He does it as a full-time job. And, uh, you know, recently in this buyer's market that we've been operating, you've been able to negotiate significantly below market value deals as well, uh, which is always super convenient. Uh, But then once we've got the deal, you know, there is a period of time from signing the contract to actually handing over that property in that under contract phase. I personally feel as though this is the most stressful part of the whole entire process. So what happens during this under contract phase? What are the things to look out for? What are the emotions that we're going to experience and have to deal with throughout that journey? Yeah, I think just to talk to what you were saying before, and this flows over into the the under contract phase as well, um, and that's just... You know, whilst the agents we were talking about are professionals and they're doing it every day, you know, they are humans too. And I feel like I find I have a whole lot more success just being, you know, being a good person and treating them being yourself. with respect and just, you know, having fun with them as well, like being their friend and, and just just overall being a good person rather than getting you back up and being on the defense and feeling like they're trying to do the wrong thing by you by Love default. That. Um, and that flows into as well, you know, you do have to work with this agent and, and it's going to go through solicitors and that type of thing from that contract stage through to settlement. But that stressful period is so much nicer if you can just give that agent a call throughout the process and find out how things are tracking or give them updates and that type of thing. It just makes that feel um, just so much more manageable mm. because like you said, it is an overwhelming um, and potentially stressful period. You've got um, things like building and pest reports, you know, if you're in Queensland coming after the contractual stage that, mm. that have to be managed. You are dealing with solicitors and, and, you know, everyone who's dealt with solicitors before you don't understand half the things they're trying to say to you and, <laughs> and you're signing documents and contracts that are, you know, 30 pages long. And there is a lot going on that's, you know, if, you don't, if you're only doing it a few times in your life, it's a lot to consider. So. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think it's important to have a quality team of advisors there. Like have a good solicitor, have a good building and pest inspector that you trust, you know, have a good insurance broker, you know, lean on your advisors. Like so many Australians want to do it all themselves and just be like, nah, I'm a self-made property investor. And, you know, kudos to you if that's what you want to do. But at the same time, the reason that we've become what we have today is through cooperation, connection, communication with other people. And we all have gaps. We're human beings. You know, we're not perfect. There's certain things that we're good at. There's certain things that we're not so good at. The things that we're not so good at, leverage off ex- experienced professionals in that particular space to ease your concerns and what you get is better results there as well. Um, so, you know, it is such a awesome experience buying an investment property if you do it properly. But if you don't do it properly, it's going to suck and you're not going to feel as though you got the result that you want. So do the research, do the work, understand that this is only going to be, you know, one of a small number of properties, maybe a handful of properties throughout your whole entire life. So give it the work and the time that it desires. Last year in Australia, we saw 
property prices go up over 20% Australia-wide. So if you had a $500,000 house and it went up over 20%, it's now worth over $600,000. That's $100,000 that you made in a single year from just buying a property. Now, the way that we think about investing is, you know, that's income and time is money. So if you want to generate a better return on your investment, if you want to get a better result, then it is important to do the work. This stuff isn't just going to happen itself. You need to get your hands dirty. You need to do the work. You need to do the research and just accept that, you know, nothing comes for free. You know, if it's time that you need to put into it, if you, if you need to pay other people to give yourself the clarity and the sanity that you need to get a better result, then, then by all means, go down that path. But I think this has helped everybody get a much deeper understanding as to the process of buying an investment property, the things that we need to look out for, the people that we need to communicate with and um, go out there and crush it, guys. Hope you go find an awesome property. Uh, if it becomes a little bit overwhelming and you want a bit of support, we do offer a buyers agency uh, where we help a small number of people invest in the Brisbane property market. If you want more information on that, head over to our website, pumpedonproperty.com. But thanks so much for jumping on today, Ben. Not many people have as much experience as you do when buying properties. Um, so it's good for people to lean on you and listen to you in these times because, um, you know, as you said earlier in the podcast, it is important to leverage off other people's experience and successes and follow people that are on a similar path to you because, you know, they've gonna, they're going to have been there, done that, and they're going to be able to help guide you through that process as well. So thanks so much for coming. Awesome, mate. Yeah, and have fun with it. Like you say, you don't get to do it too many times in your life, so you may as well um, try and do your best to enjoy the experience. Absolutely. Woo! That's a wrap. That's a wrap. Get that cool, swim. Bro. Yeah. Oh, sweaty. So sweaty. <laughs> Oh, that's good. <laughs> that's so nice, eh? Oh.